Good evening and welcome to a joint program with the Pritzker Military Museum and Library in Chicago and the International Spy Museum in Washington, D.C. I'm Rosie Waniak, Public Programs Coordinator at the PMML. Joining us today is author Janet Wallach to discuss her book, Flirting with Danger, The Mysterious Life of Marguerite Harrison, Socialite Spy. This riveting story follows a widowed socialite of America's Gilded Age, Marguerite Harrison, who became a U.S. spy and Russian double agent from World War I to World War II. Interviewing Janet is my colleague from the International Spy Museum, Amanda Olke, Director of Adult Education, Exhibits, and Programs. Amanda? Hi, thank you so much, Rosie, and, and thank you to the PMML and to the Pritzker Foundation for supporting this program. I'm delighted to have Janet here with us this evening. Um, she is the author of 10 books, yes. and very notably, um, the story of Gertrude Bell, Desert Queen. That's a previous book that has an interesting tie-in to Flirting with Danger. That book was a New York Times notable book and has been translated into 12, yes, 12 languages. languages. That is yeah. really, really amazing. I, I truly enjoyed reading Flirting with Danger and I am very excited to interview Janet. But if you've been with us before, you'll notice that things look a little different around these parts. Janet's joining me here um, in our, on our new set at Podville Studios. So bear with me as I get my feel for this exciting uh, new look for our virtual programs. We'll be streaming them out from Podville Studios, but you'll be able to catch them on, on YouTube um, just like always. So, so we're excited for this incredible new look and um, really excited to have Janet here with us. And she's gonna do a little bit of an illustrated overview of the mysterious Mrs. Harrison, as, as she calls her. So uh, let, us, let us know a little bit before we dig into the spy work. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you both, and thank you, your organizations for this wonderful opportunity to talk about Marguerite Harrison, who I found fascinating the whole time I was working on this, this, this book. And uh, what amazed me, first of all, is she was born in 1878. That was not so long after the Civil War. And came from a true Gilded Age family with a father who was a brilliant entrepreneur. And he started a, an international shipping company and actually would take his family, including little Marguerite, to Europe every summer. So she had experience traveling from the time she was very young. Her mother was an ambitious socialite hostess who wanted only for her daughter to marry for not just money, but for a title. Yes, and that was Gilded Age. That was the perfect, perfect way to be. And Marguerite was a very pretty and very smart young girl who was also a rebel and no title for her no well no no title for her no matter how hard her mother tried <laughs> but M marguerite was so smart and intellectual that her tutor and she had governesses and tutors at home uh, said to her marguerite you can be intellectual if you like but you will get much farther in life if you are charming. And she took that to heart and she did this a very good This is kind of job. perfect for Valentine's Day <laughs> Eve, right. isn't it? We're you know, <laughs> catching more, more yes. Uh, yes. Yes. yeah, with sugar. Yes. So uh, with her charm and with her, um, with her rebellion, um, she did very well in school, went off to Radcliffe College and immediately fell in love with the landlady's son, which made her mother very unhappy and her mother took her off to Europe. In Europe, she was in London and went to dinners with the son of one of her mother's friends, and her mother liked this fellow a lot, and said to her, Marguerite, be kind to him, be nice to him, be nice to him. 
And she tried. And then she came home and she said, that fellow mother, that Winston Churchill, he is so boring to talk to. All he wants to do is talk about politics. And then when we go dancing, he's always stepping on my toes. So, no. <laughs> no to him. Well, her mistake, I guess. Well, <laughs> well maybe I don't know. not. I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. not. Well, stay tuned, everybody. Right. Uh. She did marry a prominent young fellow in Maryland, the handsomest guy in Maryland. Well, that's and something. It's, yes. not, it's not a big state, yes. though. No. <laughs> Well, he, but he was very desirable, and they fell madly in love, and her mother just fell mad. She, she said, no, you are not marrying him, and she said, yes, I am. And it turned, she was right, she did, and she had the most lavish wedding in Maryland up until that time. And they were very well suited to each other. And this was in 1901. Next year they had a son with the same name of his, as his dad, Tom, Tommy Harrison, and they lived a very good life, except they had no money. He had nothing. Her mother had warned her. Yes, she did. And then, sadly, in 1914, right after America joined World War, uh, right after the start of World War I, before we joined, he became very ill. And in 1915, at the age of 37, Marguerite became a widow. And that was sad for the 12-year-old son. But that is sort of where the adventure begins. Exactly. Exactly. So she had to do something to earn money. He left, her husband left her with a lot of debts. She didn't want to live at home. And so she went out and got a job. And first job was as a social writer at the Baltimore Sun. And then she rose to become a critic, music critic, drama critic. And then when America joined the war, she became a reporter. And what did she want to do? She was an adventurer. She wanted to go to the front. The American government said, no women at the front. Well, she thought, there must be a way. And she, uh, she approached the US Navy because they had a military d division with an intelligence area. And she applied, she filled out the forms, and they took one look at it and said, no women spies. <laughs> well, there was one last chance. The army was just starting up military intelligence. And so she went to them and she sent in her application. And they sent an interviewer who came to her and spent a long time. It's so intriguing to me. It, it <laughs> Didn't know that's how you went about this, but. Well, yes, and that's in those days, anyway. Yeah. yeah. And the, spy, the uh, interviewer said to her, how is it you speak German so well? He was very suspicious. And she said, I've always been fluent in languages. I speak four languages now. And later on, she spoke more. And he said, yeah, but did you ever live in Germany? And she said, I'm an eighth generation American and a true patriot. And so he sent the report back to headquarters and Marlboro Churchill, the head of military intelligence said, hired, I want that woman. <laughs> so that, that was the start of her, of her great adventure. Well, we're going to dive into that a little bit, but we're going to do some spoilers. We're just going to show you a little bit of what she looked like, and yes. then we'll get into more questions about her spy work. So um, I don't know if you want to comment on these photos as they as they zoom by. Well, a little bit. A little bit. A little okay. Bit. She was sent to Germany first, and by the way, the only woman that American military intelligence sent overseas in that period the only one. After Germany, she was making her way to Russia, and there she is at the Polish-Russian border. B those two countries were at war while she was doing this, so she was risking her life for sure, crossing from Poland to Russia. And we'll talk more about, okay. about that, because okay. the other photos are after her spying life, but they're so 
cool, we wanted to, to share them. And then Good. so. Okay. And there she is in Turkey, sitting on the ground, cross-legged, which she said was the most comfortable way for her to sit. <laughs> and uh, she was actually making a film in, on her way to make a film. And there she was with the native villagers sharing a meal. And these, so these are the other photos that we have are so interesting. They're all from this production called Grass. Yes. And what, what did she call this? I love what she called ah, this. Ah, this was her Bedouin airplane. <laughs> the camel all rigged out <laughs> to fly just, across the desert. <laughs> just really, and she's always looking stellar, of course. Oh, that's, yes. That's something. That matters. Yes, yes. And this was a punishing, a punishing journey. Uh, and I think, yeah, from um, yes. rivers to snow and what is kind of a treat is you can watch this whole film yes. still on YouTube and we did steal a little tiny snip of her to, to share with our audience today if this will work. Okay, this is great. This was a silent movie. Okay. Well, let's run it again, yeah. There she is. It's so fun <laughs> to think of this a hundred years ago. There, there she is for us just you know, looking like the yeah. bee's knees. <laughs> right. So um, learning about Marguerite, I, I was just so struck by this book and I'm uh, always interested in what will connect one of these spy stories with our museum. And um, there's this incredible moment, as you'll hear about her time um, in Russia, she sneaks into the Kremlin and she actually gets to meet Trotsky, who was at that time the Soviet leader of the Red Army. Now, in, in true Marguerite fashion, he of course kisses her hand. I thought, oh, of course, of course he does. She's flirting right. with danger. And so I have just the, the saddest connection to make to Trotsky, which is one of our most priceless artifacts, uh, priceless to us, which is the ax that was used to murder Trotsky, to take him out of contention. He was uh, not beloved by his fellow revolutionary. Mm -hmm. so, so I always like to tie things back to the collection when I can. So, so thanks, Hannah and Shauna, for, for sharing those images. And uh, I have to say, I saw that today at the Spy oh, Museum, that's... and it was wonderful. You have a really a terrific exhibit of what happened to Trotsky. It's the assassination. Yeah, it's just great. It is. Uh, I'm hoping to go to Mexico City someday and and see where it sounds very awful to be that interested in in no. this crime scene. But <laughs> all right, so we've set set the scene. So I'd like to ask a few questions, and then of course, as always, we will open them to our audience through the through the Q and A. So just write those in. But Okay, how did you come across Marguerite Harrison? How, how did you discover this person that we all should have heard of before? Uh, oddly enough, it was a long time ago when oh. I was in Newcastle, England, looking at the papers of Gertrude Bell at the university there. I was working on her biography. And uh, there, were th there are thousands of letters and pages of diaries and journals. But one letter just made me stop. And it was a letter that Gertrude Bell was sending home, writing about a, an American woman who had come through Baghdad in 1924. And I looked at that, and she said this woman was fascinating. She was so attractive and so intelligent. And Gertrude Bell never said that about women. Oh. So oh. it was quite, quite high a praise. Yes, yeah. high praise. And she said she had these great stories to tell, and she had everybody in her thrall. And I thought, OK, what was an American woman doing in Baghdad in 1924? She must have been a spy. Ah. And it took me many years to find the, the information about her. And fortunately, I was right. And the papers, many of the papers, were in the National Archives right here in Washington. So it was exciting to read those, those, those files, those confidential, top secret 
letters and and code, code going back and forth. It was marvelous. Well, you told us a little bit of how she came to work for military intelligence. Yes. Where, and where did she go first? You touched on it earlier, but what, what was her first mission and what was, what was she doing? She, when she finally got her papers, when, when the military was ready to send her abroad, it was 19, the end of 1918, and the Germans had just asked for an armistice. So she thought that was the end of her new job. But in fact, the Americans were going off to Paris for the Paris peace talks. And we needed to know information about Germany so that we would know what to ask in reparations, what, what we could demand. Uh, and so they sent her to find out the political, the economic, the social, and the psychological conditions in Germany. And that was her job. That was major. And she, we had nobody else there before then. The war was somewhere else, not in Germany. So she arrived at a time when Germany was actually torn asunder. Uh, the, the Kaiser had fled. There was fighting in the streets. And, uh, you painted, yeah. we, we talked about this before, you, the picture that you painted of Berlin, it, you know, gunfire and, yes. I, you know, it just yes. was breathtaking and it, it really, took you to a point in time in, in a way that I found very unexpected. And she was just... She loved it. <laughs> she, her life may have been in thorough danger, but she loved it. <laughs> and so what is, um, what kind of trade craft is she using, if any, during her time in Berlin? You know, it's, it, it, it's interesting because as I walked through the Spy Museum today and I saw all of those clever gadgets and things, they, she didn't have clever gadgets except for um, invisible ink mm -hmm. and that very basic level. Um, she had a co you know, codes and she had cipher keys. But other than that, she was using her charm and her photographic memory, and her ability to really engage with people at every level of society. So she could be just as comfortable drinking tea with the emperor in Japan, which she did later on, as she was having beer with a workman at a uh, shipbuilding factory. So that's quite, that's quite an ability. If you're going to be a spy, that's very handy. Just, ma just that charm. And so yes. this is, goes back to the whole charm. And yes. she's got it in spades. Yes. So and, from, I, and I will say this also. Yeah. She used it when she was in Germany to infiltrate both the right wing and the left wing. So she was accepted as one of them on both sides. And that happened again and again. And that's a dangerous, yes. dangerous spot to be in. What do you think was her... It, and, what do you think was their, her biggest kind of intelligence uh, collection moment in, in Germany? Oh, I think, oh, in Germany. Uh, when she saw, she, she was ordered to join a secret society, a right-wing society. And she saw the pamphlets and the brochures that were going out to recruit people. And they said, we want all German to join, all German boys to germ, join, and men. No Jews allowed. And then she, this was 1919, she saw exercises in the street with former army people, as well as young boys in pseudo-military outfits with leather belts and caps and knee-high boots, and they were marching in goose steps stomping their way to stamp out the Jews. And she reported that back because this was really the beginning of the Nazi movement. And there it was in plain sight for her. Yeah. yeah. And also I think she was very aware of how broken Germany yes. was going to be. Yes. If you yes. by the by the request for reparations if you want to. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And the other thing that she did that was very brave was she infiltrated the Socialist Party 
and was, had orders to lure to the American side an American journalist who was known to be a socialist, a very popular cartoonist in the United States. And her job was to find out, was to make sure that he was the one and get him convicted for creating pamphlets that were creating insurgencies in the American army. So this was counterintelligence, which she was also doing, and that was a very important thing. And, yeah. She had her hand in everything. And <laughs> she did. Really, in everything. So what wraps up her time in Germany? It was the, it, it was the end of the Paris peace talks. We had made our demands, and, um, and the Germans had accepted them, although not so many Germans were so happy about it. And she came back to the U.S., and got a kind of quiet thank you. No big parades or anything, but a, a quiet thank you. And she was told that she, was, she did such a good job that she was wanted everywhere. The, the top agents wanted her in Mexico, in Japan, or back in Europe. And she said, no, there's something really important going on in Russia. And that was the Bolshevik Re Revolution. It was just ending. And she felt that there would be a major social impact, and she wanted to find out what that was going to be like. And if there was anything that might be interesting that other countries like the U.S. might even be able to gain from that. So uh, were, were people like Marguerite Harrison or basically any Americans welcomed uh, no. in Russia at that time? <laughs> no. no. So uh, how, how did our, our lovely and mysterious <laughs> Mrs. Harrison get herself into Russia? Well, she tried to get a visa and the Bolshevik government said no visa for you because uh, they knew too much about her actually. Uh, and so she snuck across the border from Poland taking her life in her hands. And she just went across no man's land and then got her way into Russia and made her way to Moscow. And, and, it, and the, that is a lot more than it sounds <laughs> like. That, that it's quite, quite a story in, yes. in the book. So, yes. But yes. sneaking in and then there she is. And how does she, how does she start building a network of, of people when she's there in Moscow? Well, it was using that charm and that keen intellect. And she met people like Lenin and, as you said, Trotsky. Uh, she met Mayakovsky, the poet, and Anna Tolstoya, the daughter of the writer. She met uh, uh, John Reed and Louise Bryant, the American journalist and Alexander Berkman, the anarchist, and Emma Goldman, his friend, the anarchist. So she knew a lot of she, people. And once again, she was insinuating herself into all levels of society. And what kind of, what information was she sending back home? When she made her way into the Kremlin very cleverly, she not only met Trotsky there, but she broke into a secret room that had all of the propaganda network of the Bolshevik people, of the Bolshevik party, the government. And she photographed some of it, she made notes on some of it, and she had a photographic memory. Pages and pages of this vast network of propaganda and she sent it back to the U.S. That was invaluable. And I'm thinking about that today. So what year is that that she's seeing this? I mean, we always say the Russians have been doing this for so long and they are so good at propaganda. And when yes. you hear about her seeing the propaganda exhibit, and wow, the guts yes. it took. Yes, this was 1920. Yeah. 1920. And so how would she get the material home? She used invisible ink to send to, get, to hand to give messages to people or she would write on the tiny inside of a match of a matchbook and she befriended a lot of diplomats and but she had to 
sneak into places to get to the diplomats to give them the messages, always taking her life in her hands every time she did this. She actually was able to send back a vast economic report that was written by an American engineer for Lenin. And when Lenin read it, he, he said to this man, you are not leaving this country. This is a terrible report. And it, it, it was all about the failures of the Bolshevik government, the infrastructure, the economy, the food production. Neither the report nor the man was supposed to leave, correct? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But she got a hold of that report and she got it out. Oh my God. So what, um, what's her relationship like with Russian intelligence? Are they watching her? Oh, they were watching her all the time, all the time. And she had an, interro an interrogator who was actually the chief of uh, espionage interrogation in, in the Kremlin, in, in Lubyanka prison. And they had an interesting relationship because it was intellectual. They would discuss literature and poetry and music and philosophy. And he was quite charming, I think probably just as, as charming as she was. And there was an attraction there, but he was also a communist interrogator of spies. And he was quite tough on her at their meetings, which took place co continually, weekly. And she had to really uh, dance her way through those meetings. So um, ultimately, she gets into a position where he asks her to do what? Well, it was, you will be imprisoned in Siberia for the rest of your life, or more likely executed if you don't cooperate with us. And she said, well, what does that mean? And he said, we want you to be an agent for us. So she became a double agent. And that scared the bejeebies out of her um, and so she, again, she was maneuvering her way, trying to give as little information as she could to the Russians and um, let people know that she was in danger and not to talk to her. I know. That's, she didn't want to b betray people exactly. and that is such a, can I get by with this gossip uh -huh. I've heard or, right. yeah. But, right. so why does her tightrope act fall apart? Why does it fall apart? Well, she, she went one step. They, when they found out, they knew what she was doing. And it finally came to the point where they just couldn't let her do this anymore. And so she spent a long time in Lubyanka prison, the worst possible place she could be. Yeah. And people did not usually come out of there. No, they didn't. And how, how long was she there? She was there almost a year. And uh, she spent time in solitary confinement, but she was so disciplined that she managed to keep herself going with exercises every day. She would walk in this tiny cell back and forth, 500 steps every day, twice a day. She would quiz herself to keep her mind occupied because she didn't see anybody. There was no light. There was no conversation. There was nothing. She had nothing. She would play games with herself. She made pickup sticks out of matches. Uh, anything to keep her mind challenged and her body in good shape. And she just focused on the present. That was what she told herself, just keep thinking about the present. So when we do mindfulness now, we, that, I kept thinking, that's what well, this is all about, isn't it? Same the, sort of thing. thing. Yeah. So how does she get out of La Bianca? Oh, I'm not sure I want to tell you that. All right, you don't have to. You don't have to tell me that. We can, we can skip ahead okay. to something. Um, I don't know if you're willing to say... How did she end up in La Bianca again? Oh, well, 
she this is gets starts getting very weird it does get weird and in fact the what what preceded it was really very interesting as well so i'll talk about that a little yeah, bit okay yeah. uh she came back to the u.s after after russia and was kind of left out in the cold. She was the spy well, left out in the cold. It's, because, she's sort of suspicious now. Yes, Who, and exactly. she was a double agent, exactly. but she was trying to protect people. Right. You're never going to not, you know, not look suspicious. Right. But Marlboro Churchill knew that she was patriotic and had done nothing wrong. And so he sent her on a mission that was a, a tr truly top secret, and he told the very few people who needed to know, it was really that kind of thing, um, not to give her any written papers, not to have her name on anything, but he sent her to the Far East, and she arrived in Japan. And it's just everywhere. This, is, this everywhere. book is breathtaking. Yes. <laughs> yeah, the scope of this book and the time yes. period. Yeah. And she and the British were very much a presence in Japan. And with her charm and her beauty, she did have a British fellow t agent who fell in love with her and wanted her to be a spy for the British on the Japanese. And then she met the Japanese and they wanted her to be a spy on the Chinese. And then she met the Chinese. This was as she traveled throughout the Far East. She went to China, and they wanted her to spy on the Russians. And all along, the Americans wanted her to spy on all of them. So she was quite a busy woman. And then she wound up in prison. But what was so interesting was she had this, she felt this pull she felt such a pull to go to Russia. I feel like if I'd spent a year in Lubyanka, I'd be like, I'm going to stay in New York. I'm going to stay back in the States. But she was desperate to get back to Russia, where she knew she was going to be in incredible jeopardy. Of course, of course. And nobody could figure it out. Her, her father-in-law, who was an astrophysics scientist, and knew so much, could not figure out what she was doing. Her son said, all she wants to do is get in trouble. At least she should get in trouble in the United States so she could be in prison in America. <laughs> I see. Well, you brought up her son, so I'm going to break, break my own rules and ask a couple <laughs> audience questions before I go on with mine, because people are very concerned about that son. Someone wants to know um, who watched her son while she was on assignment, and somebody else wanted to know what happened to her son. Since you mentioned him, I thought we, we yes. could take a sidebar into Tommy. Yes, Tommy's yes, life. Tommy. Yeah. Uh, while she was, when she was traveling, uh, uh, her her mother-in-law and and her mother-in-law's husband uh, looked after Tommy, and they were very kind and very intelligent people. So they were very good, very good to him, and he always kept a photo of his grandmother on his on his dresser drawer, uh, dresser. So um, he, he cared very much about them and they, they for him. What happened to him was he had a much quieter life than his mother. Um, uh, he they, he and, and Marguerite seemed to be on good terms, but he, and he never really presented it as a problem to his mother, but he did complain to his friends and he did feel abandoned. For sure, and, and there me, were you know you would say oh another Christmas without her son and right. he'd be in a boarding school as when he's younger and right. and uh, yeah it's interesting as though she had this longing for it but also there was this drive to be in in danger in the thick of things exactly. where in the world do you think this passion for espionage and danger, can't, this flirting with danger, where did this come from? I think the, the adventure side of it came from her father, her admiration. She said her fa father was the man that she admired the most, that she was 
loved the most. And he was always traveling. He was always going off on adventures. And he would take her with him sometimes. So that's where it started. And she certainly did not want to be a social hostess like her mother for all her life. Uh, adventure was just from the very beginning, from the time that she was a little kid. She was you know, climbing rooftops and doing crazy things. So danger was, was uh, in her blood. Well, you were talking a bit about this, this interesting period as she's, she's traveling through Japan and parts of China, and everyone wanted her to spy, but how about her reputation as a spy? That it, it did come up uh, because there was somebody who was trying to blackmail her, and that came out in the British papers and in the American papers while she was in Japan. So the, 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 and the Japanese really loved her. So they were shocked by it. And there were a couple of times when she was almost arrested and um, somehow or other she got away. <laughs> well, you, she was very well known, very well known yes. in her time. She's yes. on these lecture circuits. I, you know, why? Why didn't, why haven't we heard about her espionage work before? Well, you know, spies do keep it low keyed. She wrote, she did write an autobiography, but um, women spies in particular kind of disappear, which is sad. But she did do a couple of things that, that made her particularly proud beside, beside, besides the espionage. She started a school for children who were too ill to go to school. They were in hospital and not able to really advance their education. And so she started a school that became very important in Maryland for those children. And later on, she wanted to be accepted in the male world as a spy. And no was the answer because she was a woman and she found that some of her friends <coughs> excuse me were in the same situation and so they started the women's geographical society and had prominent women as part of their part of their organization and did a very good work supporting morally and financially women who were going off as explorers, as scientists, all over the world. Well, the idea that this, this movie Grass documenting this incredible, you know, migration, yes. migration of a yes. people through, like, really, they couldn't find anywhere better to go or a better <laughs> way to get, you know, mountain passes, raging rivers, and filming it all, all along the way. And um, one thing that was interesting was one of the filmmakers went on to make King Kong, exactly. the first King Kong, and I thought, oh my gosh, you can can see that in this, you know, the the right. adventurers yes. in the exotic lands, and yes. I mean, it's just amazing. So, do you think that she did any additional spying later on? It, she probably did some, but I don't think much. I think. She uh, lived in Europe. She wrote, as I mentioned, she wrote an, an autobiography which was, um, had a, had kept as many secrets as it let out, unfortunately. But it did give me a sense. It was not easy to read because there are no paragraphs and there's no index and there's no <laughs> hardly any con table of contents. Uh, so it's deep. It's, it's, hard to plow through, but there, were, there, were, there was information there. Um, but she lived a, a fairly quiet life after that. And she was kind of like the spy out in the cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah really not in, invited in after, no. I mean, yeah, whenever you've been in so many locations, at some point people wonder, and that was yes. interesting to read in the book. That yes. What's she doing and why does she keep doing right. it? And she did work for VOA for a bit uh, during World War II. Ah. Yeah. yeah. 
did she do any broadcasting? I can imagine her. I, I couldn't find it. Maybe, maybe the Spy Museum okay, will find we'll, it. Okay, we'll, mm. we'll be on the lookout. <laughs> so you talked a little bit about the National Archives, but how um, someone here wanted to know, how did you research this intelligence work? You've found the, found the letter, the reference by mm -hmm. Gertrude Bell. How did you just keep it in the back of your head, or how did you start looking for this elusive spy? Uh, it was I, I. I did read that autobiography, and I do have to thank Mr. Google, who, <laughs> because by by using Google and using the internet, I was able to find out that there were papers at the National Archives invaluable papers. And it was thrilling to spend time there and hold in my hands these, these letters that, even though they were copies, they, they were the letters. And, oh no, actually they weren't. Some of them were, were the originals. Many it's of them were original. It was thrilling. Uh, so there was that. And it wasn't just her, on her side. It was memos and, and classified material going all through the intelligence system. So people were commenting about her, talking about her, in those, in that, and that material is in those files. And in fact, when she was arrested in Moscow, there was a comment from somebody in Washington because her father-in-law was wanted to know how she was, and, and he had heard that she was in prison. And this head, number two in intelligence in, in Washington, t told her father-in-law, you don't have to worry about Marguerite. She's probably giving advice to Trotsky. <laughs> that's, that's how they thought of her. <laughs> oh, it would have been great to, no. great to meet her. Oh, yeah. we have a question. Um, what made her turn to film after spying uh, instead of returning to journalism? She was restless and she wanted adventure and she ran into a fellow she had known in Russia. A, a that man, is fascinating. A man fascinating she story. had helped while he was in prison, an uh, American, and he told her that he, he had been a flyer for the American part of the, the Kosciuszko Brigade for the Poles in World War II. He told her that he had just made a film and somewhere in Asia, I think, uh, and wanted to do a movie about a migratory tribe. Would she be interested? And, she, and, and did she know anybody who had any money? And by that time, she had a little money. And she said, yes, I know somebody who'd be interested, and yes, I will give you some money, but I want to be in this film and do it with you. And that's how they started out. Uh, it was a tribe in Iran, which was Persia then. They needed to, they, but they thought it was so difficult to get to, to, to Iran that they would see if there were any tr other tribes anywhere else. And so they started off in Turkey and found Those nothing. are some of the images we saw yes, earlier. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And they made their way to Iraq, to Syria and to Iraq, and that's where she met Gertrude Bell. And Gertrude Bell said, oh, a movie about the Bakhtiari tribe would be fascinating. Uh, very dangerous, the most dangerous tribe probably in Iran. They were robbers and kidnappers and murderers, but yeah, sure, go ahead. <laughs> they take their lives in their hands twice a year. They take the most dangerous routes that there are, but they keep their animals alive by finding the grass and finding the sun and the warmth. So. Go, well, watching, go. watching the film is, uh, is really amazing to see these people that you read a little description of and realize that there they are yes. on film. Uh, if someone wants to know, did she do any intelligence work during World War II that you're aware of? I, no, I don't think she did. I don't think she did. Do you think she missed that or do you think? I, yes. But it was too late, and the FBI was suspicious. Yeah. yeah. So that was it. I think she would have loved, loved to have done so. She was very, 
she was very sympathetic to all sorts of people, and that right. I think right. makes it difficult sometimes yes. for for people to. Yes. Well, where do your sympathies actually exactly. lie? Exactly. So we've. We've talked about her film. Who do you think should play her? Is this going to be oh. a movie? Or are we going to see a movie at any time? I'm not sure. What do you think? Who should play her? I usually count on Hannah and Shauna to come up with. <laughs> so she's about 40-ish at right. this time. So, right. How about Annette Benning? Would she do? What she, she's great. She's, she's great. great. Actress. But you got it because you got to look great you know, on your travels right. and, and also be incredibly. Right. Oh, incredibly somebody young. Somebody younger, probably. Yeah. 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 But. Well, maybe people will have some ideas for us. Well, I'll keep my eyes <laughs> over here. Um, any lessons you've learned from her, from her life? Good, bad? <laughs> well, uh, one thing she, that I did learn in terms of her fearlessness is that, and I think it was Marion Cooper who made the film with her, who said the reason that she wasn't afraid was because she knew how to study the situation beforehand, and she knew what would be dangerous in the situation. And so once she confronted that danger in her imagination, then she could deal with it in real life. Wow. And I think that's a very good lesson to learn. Yeah. Yeah. Just and just, be empathetic and be charming. Yeah, <laughs> the charming. Very true. Very true. So what are you working on now? Are you Well, I'm you don't have I'm to considering a few projects, so we'll see. Yeah. But it's it's great fun. I'm doing talks on Marguerite Harrison and it's great fun too. So to which of let her be known in the, in the yeah. world? Yeah. Well, do you want to comment at all on on Gertrude Bell's uh, significance and what did what did Marguerite think of Gertrude Bell? Oh, Marguerite thought the world of Gertrude Bell, and in fact, um, when Gertrude Bell died, Gertrude Bell was older than Marguerite. When she died, Marguerite did a, a big piece in the New York Times magazine because she was a journalist for a long she time. Did, yeah, she, she, she did. Yeah, she kept writing. Yeah. Writing. Yes, and she, and she did quite a lot for the Times. So that was an interesting piece, and that gave me insight into their relationship. You know, uh, and, and Gertrude Bell was a formidable woman, most powerful woman in the British Empire after Queen Victoria died. That's, and, and I saw the headlines all from papers all over the world when I was working on that book. It was extraordinary. And then, are there other commonalities, other characters like this in, in your other books that you feel, because you can see the interplay between yes. these two. Are, yes. there, are there other strands, other people? Uh, uh, nobody of their, of their ilk. I did, I did do a book on a woman named Hetty Green, who was the richest woman in America. When she died in 1916, she left $100 million. And that w that's worth about $3 billion today. So she was formidable, and she was a formidable character. So in her own right, in her own world, she kind of equaled them. And she said, they all set a path for women, and that's what I admire. They were smart. They were indomitable. It makes you realize yeah. you can succeed if you just keep, keep pushing. I mean, yes. no one said no. That's right, and believe in yourself. Yeah. Oh, someone wants to know, um, how many languages was she fluent in? We've touched on some of them. Yes, she was fluent in seven languages. There was French and German, and, and she spoke French and German like a native. She passed as a native. That was one of, one of the things that she did that was so dangerous, but she pretended to be the wife, the wife of a German officer or you know, a, a French woman. Um, she spoke... Uh, Italian almost as well. She spoke Polish, she spoke Russian, Turkish, and uh, there are a couple of others that, you know. But she was, it was interesting, Persian she seemed able to pick up, yes. but she was challenged by, chi was it Chinese? Chinese and Japanese. She had a, a much harder time, yes. 
Yeah. Isn't that isn't yeah. that interesting? Yeah. Well, they were yeah very different. Yeah. Well, what do you think she'd be doing now if she was with us? Oh my! Do you think she'd be the head of the CIA? Well, do you think she'd we be do have a woman as the head of the CIA, and so Marguerite kind of you know she laid the path. <laughs> Or do we think she'd be a, a tech billionaire? Oh, no. No, 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 no. 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 She <laughs> was, maybe she'd be doing <laughs> lunar people, explorations. People and politics and world affairs, that was really her, her world. So, yeah, CIA would have been the place for She her. would have liked that yes. very, very yes. much. Well, um, one final thing to tie it back to, to World War I, which yes. we're exploring. Um, how do you think, you know, she really shaped our country's thinking at the time. She wanted Americans to be in touch, more in touch with people and places around the world. And not to be isolationists, but to understand the, the connectedness of countries and politics and events. We are all part of the same world and of those, and of those events. And she really believed in that firmly. And what, what upset her most was when America would become isolationist. And she struggled with that. And her, her work was really to, to bring us closer to the rest of the world. It's really admirable. Yes. Really a, a yes. very brilliant life's work to yes. devote yourself to. Well, I'm going to kick this back over to my friend Rosie. Hi, Rosie. Hi, Amanda. Thank you all for joining us this evening. That's about all the time we have for tonight. Thank you, Janet Wallach, for bringing this riveting story to the fore. Thank and you. thank you again to Amanda from the International Spy Museum for moderating this discussion. Be sure to join us in two weeks on February 27th to learn more about the origins of spycraft in America with author Mark Stout, who will discuss his book, World War I and the Foundations of American Intelligence. You can register for this and other programs at pritzkermilitary.org or at spymuseum.org. This concludes to, our program. Oh, I have to say one last thing because Mark Stout is in the acknowledgments here because um, <laughs> Janet talked to him and I had forgotten to say that earlier, so it very much ties our two talks yeah. together. Sorry, Rosie. No, not at all. Thanks for uh, bringing that to our attention. I didn't even know that, <laughs> so that's very exciting. Um, but thank you again, everyone, for joining us. This concludes our program, and have a wonderful night.